we were separated intentionally by design from the, from the foundation of the Berlin Conference, we have been separated. We come from different walks, different parts of the world, but yet we are all in common. We are Africans and that's who we are and that's who we must unite to become one unified race, Africans. We have an incredible, an incredible um, Zoom call today. We have uh, some leaders that have uh, elders that have been in the trenches and they're gonna share some information with you pertaining to what is the definition of a diaspora? I do look so forward to it and I am so glad that you all are here but I just want to leave you with this also now, you have an obligation. By default, you have an obligation now to share with your other brothers and sisters. The fact that you're here, you must now begin to share this awakening process with your brothers and sisters. Uh, those that have been here before, you should bring someone with you because it is time for our people to awaken. And at times it takes one of us to awaken one of our brothers and sisters that are asleep, that are fast asleep. So won't take up much more of your time, but I am so excited and at all that you all are here. So prepare yourselves because the mission has begun and you, you are the chosen ones. So prepare yourselves, stay faithful. We're gonna get it done because it is time. And with that, I will yield back to my sister Ray to continue on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Damian Cook. That was our vice president of ADDI. And at this present time, I would like to call on our dear, Her Excellency, Ambassador, Dr. Arikana Chiambori Kwao, to give her welcome remarks. Dr. Kwao, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sister Ray. To uh, Dr. Horn, to my sister, Dr. Bickman, um, the entire ADDI family, all of those who are joining us from all over the world. I can't thank you enough for consistently and repeatedly coming to these Zooms most Saturdays for us to just have some time to talk about us and how we can reclaim the driver's seat of Africa's development. As most of you know, in 2003, the African Union incorporated the African diaspora into the African Union constitution as the sixth region. The reason we're here today, this is now 2023, 30 years later, we still are yet to realize that sixth region. What is forward? My understanding, after consulting with various heads of states and challenging them, one, the definition of the African diaspora as it stands, it states all people of African descent living outside Africa. To which I would then challenge the heads of states and say, with all due respect, Mr. President, if you were to stand at the edge of the Americas on the East Coast and you are to yell, ask all people of African descent, according to the AU definition, that thank you. If you were to ask all of descendants of the formerly enslaved to come home to Africa, and assuming we could walk across the Atlantic to West Africa, what would happen when we get to the coast of West Africa? They'll start asking us about where we were born. 
And like I normally say, this brother would say I was born in Nigeria. And they say, welcome home. The sister will say I was born in Sierra Leone. They'll say, come on in. And then they get to the next brother who says I was born in Angeles, California. They're gonna to wanna to know what you, where were you born, where's your visa? I said, therefore, excellent, we're not equal. The definition as it stands is insufficient until descendants of the formerly enslaved can also get dual citizenship of at least one country in Africa, then and only then are we equal. Then and only then is, is the definition inclusive. It is my humble opinion that the definition as it stands, it needs a little bit more meat to it. And that's why we are here today to talk about what do we need to do to make sure that the definition is inclusive and also as we move towards PAC, that we also look at making sure the definition is inclusive, but also to make sure that something is done to equalize the playing field. But that I'm talking about a pathway to citizenship. So the definition can be meaningful. It's a very important concept, but we are the only people who can bring the change that we desire. What I was told was that the reason the sixth region has not been realized is because we, the African diaspora, are too disorganized. We fight all the time, that's their perception. They see us as just noisemakers and complainers. To some extent, there is some truth to that. But again, like VP said, we were intentionally taught how to dislike ourselves and how to dislike each other. Not working together, not believing in each other, not supporting each other is not in our new DNA. Our original DNA as Africans, we always work together. The spirit of Ubuntu was alive and well. But somewhere along the way, we have lost our ways. We need to come together. If we are going to realize the sixth region, if we are going to make sure that we are inclusive and we claim our rightful place on the world stage, unity of purpose is what this moment is calling for. Today we are joined with two of our elders and I'm one of them, but I'm not as, as smart and as knowledgeable as they are. They've been in the trenches for a long time. They know the history, they know the journey. What we need right now is to get to the finish line. And that's what this is about. So I hope as all of you come together, you come together with one mind, one mind that says it's about solutions. It's not about fighting. It's not about who knows what. It's not about who has done what. This is where we are. We are riding a sinking Titanic. So are we going to change sea while we are sitting in a sinking Titanic? Or we're going to come together and agreeing that there are several holes in the Titanic. The sooner we spread out and fix the holes, the better off all of us are going to be. So for we will be able to make it ashore. But if we continue to fight and argue and disagree and grandstand, guess what? We're going to be looking at each other at the bottom of the ocean while each and every one of us is gasping for their last breath. That's our simple analysis and our reality of where we are today. We can continue <clears throat> the bickering and arguing and we leave it on to our children. We shall leave it on to their grandchildren and the bit goes on. We will continue to be the people who brought humanity into the world will always be servants to those who we brought into this world. I don't know about you. I have a problem with that. So today, let's create that unity of purpose as we embark on a journey. Let's listen to our elders, share with us their views, the journey, and impact their wisdom and knowledge. So after they finish talking to us about our history, we can then have a healthy conversation in terms of what we think is the most inclusive definition of who we are 
as children of Africa living outside Africa. Those descendants of the formerly enslaved and those who left Africa in search of running away from wars and famine, for whatever reason, those individuals who were born in Africa who are now living outside Africa. We are all the African diaspora. Well, to our discussion on our Africa, our way, the Pan-African spirit must live on. Thank you all. And once again, Dr. Hohn, Dr. Bickman, welcome to the platform. I yield back to you, Sister Ray. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And at this present time, I would like to call on our ADDI 8th Pan-African Congress Coordinator, Mr. Spiwe Baleka. Thank you, you Sister. Thank you, Sister Ray. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador Erikana Chihombore Kwao and ADDI Vice President Damian Cook. Uh, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you, Pan-Africanists, members of the African diaspora, all over the world. I would especially like to thank the um, members of the Council of Pan-African Diaspora Elders. And when I first reached out to uh, the ambassador um, and got involved in coordinating this uh, Eighth Pan-African Congress, um, the first two people that I thought of uh, who I know from personal experience who have been involved in developing this AU6 region were Dr. David Horn and Dr. Beryl Beekman, who we will hear from both of them um, this evening. So it is a great honor and privilege and blessing to have them um, join us tonight. In order to, uh, and also I want to welcome and thank um, all of our committee members that have formed since we launched these preparatory conferences. We now have functioning and active committees with chairs. And I've seen some of the um, committee chairs have joined us. Um, Brother Sakani of the Youth Committee, Brother Kevin, who is on the Citizenship Committee and several other committees. We have a Tech Committee. I'm not sure if Brother Philip has joined us yet, but um, for all of the people that have joined the committees, we wanna thank you for the great work that you are doing. Now, Tonight's discussion is focused on the single theme of defining the diaspora. And in order to set a foundation for that discussion and to frame it, I've prepared this short presentation um, that I believe we need to know and understand so that we can, you know, that principle of Sankofa, in order to know where we're going, we have to know where we have been. So I'm gonna do this presentation, get everybody caught up to speed, we're going to hear from our keynote and guest speaker tonight, and then we're going to open up the floor and make sure we have plenty of time to hear from each and every one of you, because we know that this is uh, a conversation that is going to have robust input from people from around the world with various understandings, various wisdom, and various opinions. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, the definition of the diaspora. Uh, and again, um, you know, I'm familiar with this proverb. If you want to solve a problem, you must go to its origin. You must um, go to the root of the problem. And you know the tree by the fruit that it bears. So we must go back and get it. Yeah. Now, how the African Union try to move this out of the way. How the African Union was established to include the African diaspora. In uh, September of 1999 in Sirte, Libya, um, the declaration was to uh, establish an African Union. Can Betty, can Betty please mute your phone? Can we have someone please mute Betty? Thank you. Um, there was a declaration to establish an African Union in conformity with the ultimate objectives of the charter of our continental organization and the Treaty of African Economic Community. In July of 2000 in Lome, Togo, they signed the AU Constitutive Act. In March of 2001, at an extraordinary summit, they finalized the plans 
uh, and drafted the Pan-African Parliament Protocol. In 2001, at the Lusaka Summit, the Secretary General was mandated to work out the modalities and guidelines for launching the organs of the AU. And in July 2002, in Durban, South Africa, they drafted the protocol relating to the establishment of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. After they did all of this prep work, they were now ready to establish the African Union in its headquarters in Addis Ababa, which they did in February 2003. Okay, why is my... All right, at the CERT meeting in Libya, it was bankrolled by Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, who dreamed of becoming the president of the United States of Africa. This was opposed by Presidents Obasanjo of Nigeria and Thabo Mbeki of South Africa. President Obasanjo and Abdullahi uh, Wade of Senegal also opposed reparations for slavery and colonialism, which was the strategy of the Black world at the 2001 UN World Conference in South Africa against racism. Uh, I know that some people that are here on this call were present at that World Conference against racism. Uh, the president of Senegal, Wade, Gaddafi, and Obasanjo played key roles in the formation of the AU. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Senegal's president, Abdiola Wade, bad, yeah. made uh, the following comments, right, uh, just prior to the World Conference Against Racism. He said, quote, I am opposed to demanding financial recompense. It is absurd. Some of us have forebears who may not have sold slaves, but had slaves in their armies. I am talking about my own ancestors who had 10,000 soldiers at that time, of which two thirds were slaves. Should they also pay up? The president of Senegal continued and said, if one can claim reparations for slavery, then the slaves of my ancestors or their descendants can also claim money from me. It's not the Europeans of today or the Americans of today who brought slavery, he said. It's the ancestors. Me personally, how can I be responsible for what my ancestors did in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries? This is what he said in an interview to the Associated Press concerning reparations. Now, the African Union then convened the first African Union Western Hemisphere Diaspora Forum in Washington, D.C. in December of 2002. At that meeting, they had decided that the African Union should consider the African diaspora as business partners and establish official programs to identify and qualify diaspora businesses and issue a common visa or eliminate business travel visas for diaspora businesses. Now, it is my opinion that this was sort of the beginning of where we're at today and that they started off on the wrong foot, that we should not be considered as business partners. We should be considered as those who have birthrights in our ancestral loan, uh, uh, homelands who were trafficked and taken as prisoners of war. That is how we should have been considered, in my opinion. Now, at that first extraordinary summit of the Assembly of Heads of States and, government, uh, uh, um, and Governments held in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia on February 3, 2003, Senegal, okay, this is why that section on Abdul Wade is important. It was Senegal that proposed the amendment to formally integrate the diaspora in the policy framework of the African Union. Here I'm showing you my present information card from the Ministry of Information of the Government of Ethiopia back in my devout Rastafarian days and my press credentials that allowed me to be in the building when this was being discussed. And this is why I'm able to report on some of this. On March 3rd, on March 3rd 2003, I made the following report from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, which said, According like, yeah, to the report, can, can we get Betty to mute her phone? Thank you. According to the report of the ad hoc ministerial committee meeting on the proposed amendments to the Constitutive Act of the African Union, point nine, prior to detailed consideration of this item, the chairperson gave the floor successively to the commission and the Senegalese delegation for clarifications on this subject. 
The representative of the commission indicated that six proposed amendments had been referred to the ad hoc ministerial committee, but that the one relating to the African diaspora had been inadvertently omitted from the items listed on the agenda of the meeting. He added that the item had not been examined by the executive council session in Tripoli because it had not been submitted in time. He then read out the amendments as contained in paragraph 40 of the report of the first extraordinary session of the Executive Council as follows. Invite and encourage the full participation of Africans in the diaspora in the building of the African Union in its capacity as an important part of the continent. At the chairperson's request for more clarification on the categories of Africans that come under the term African diaspora, the delegation of Senegal, the proposal of the proposer of the amendment, informed the meeting that the issue could be addressed from two perspectives, namely, A, a narrow sense whereby the diaspora includes all Africans currently residing anywhere outside the continent of Africa. And I would note here when it says include all Africans, when they, when the proposer, Senegal said that, that is being used in the sense that if you were born in Nigeria, you are African. If you were born in Cameroon, you are African. If you are born in Jamaica, you are Jamaican. If you are born in Barbados, you are Barbadian. So it's important for us to understand the sense of the words being used here. The second uh, perspective was a broad and historic sense, whereby the diaspora comprises all Africans who had left Africa by force and still consider themselves Africans. It was decided at the end of the debate that the overall principle underlying the amendment should be retained and incorporated in the Constitutive Act as proposed, even though that principle had not been clearly identified. On the question of uh, as to how this amendment would be implemented, it was proposed that this matter be examined um, at a collective brainstorming session of the committee before the end of the meeting to come up with proposed proposals for submission to the Executive Council, as it was at the, implement, at the implementation level that all aspects of bilateral cooperation between the two entities would be addressed with greater clarity. What that is saying is, is that as we go through the process of figuring out the relationship and how the AU is going to work with the diaspora. It was in going through that process that clarity on this definition would be achieved. It was also proposed that the matter be further considered subsequently at experts and executive council levels for further inputs. Subsequently, at the end of the consideration of all the agenda items, the committee devoted some time to collective brainstorming on the issue of the diaspora, particularly its definition and the modalities for implementing effective collaboration with the African Union. During the discussions, a number of proposals were made, such as the need to convene a forum between the AU and the diaspora and the setting up of coordinating mechanisms within the commission to deal with issues relating to the diaspora. A proposal was also made that the diaspora could be involved in the work of the Economic, Social, and Cultural Council. At the end of the deliberations, the need was recognized to convene a session of the Executive Council entirely devoted to the diaspora. Uh, it appears as if Kwasi is doing some kind of markup. Uh, uh, Kwasi, whoever, if that's you, um, if you could try to fix that, please. Thank you. Uh, at the end of the deliberations, again, the need was recognized to convene a session of the Executive Council entirely devoted to the diaspora. Okay. On February 3rd and 4th, 2003, at that first extraordinary summit of the Assembly of the African Union meeting in Addis Ababa, right, they adopted the historic Article 3Q amendment that officially invites and encourages the full participation of Africans in the diaspora in the building of the African Union in its capacity as an important part of our continent. From this decision, the African diaspora would become designated as the sixth region of the African Union. 
Now, following up on their decision to hold an experts meeting, right? In May of 2003, so just a few months after that first meeting, they had an executive council session devoted to the decision on the development of the diaspora initiative in the African Union, in which they had decided that um, supports the initiative of the commission to convene a technical workshop as soon as possible to develop a concept paper to generate proposals on the relationships between the AU and the diaspora. The proposed workshops would also address the following issues, the definition of the diaspora, the role of the diaspora in reversing African brain drain in line with NEPAD recommendations, and the modalities of the creation of a diaspora fund for investment and development in Africa. So you can already see that at this point, they have proceeded to go forward while defining the diaspora by considering us as business partners and not as um, African people who have a birthright claim to territory in Africa. They finally held the African Technical Workshop on the relationships with the diaspora, which was held in Port of Spain, Trinidad in June of 2004. I encourage everyone who is really serious about understanding where we are to read this report. This is the foundational report that, that considered all the broad aspects, aspects of what we need to do as the AU sixth region and our relationship with the, with the African Union. This is sort of the foundational report. And it's available on the uh, website that I will provide the link to after I finish. At the meeting of experts on the definition of the African diaspora held in April of 2005, the definition of the African diaspora as determined by the meetings was as follows. The African diaspora consists of people of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. Now, that was the definition that these experts um, uh, decided. And if you ask who were these experts, that meeting was chaired by His Excellency Ambassador Joe Keshi, representative of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and was attended by experts appointed by Algeria, Angola, Benin, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Gabon, Ghana, Guinea, Lesotho, Libya, Malawi, Mali, Mauritania, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, Republic of Congo, Sarari Arab Republic, Senegal, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Sudan, Swaziland, Tanzania, and Zambia. So at least in this official report, there was the members of the diaspora, uh, or at least the historic diaspora, were not present in defining the diaspora. I would also like to note that this definition is severely flawed in light of the quote-unquote out-of-Africa DNA studies. What is to stop a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Swede desiring to contribute to the development of Africa, for example, from claiming status as a member of the African diaspora, since current science states that his or her ancestors and all human beings originated in Africa. So many of you may remember this particular case in the United States, right, um, with Rachel Dolezal, who is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Caucasian who passed as a member of the African diaspora and even served as the chairperson of the NAACP in, I think, South Carolina. In an interview, she said, there's a pan-African diaspora, so I'm part of the pan. We all go back to Africa. We all have a Black mother eventually. Okay. Now, I won't go into it in too much detail right now, but there are um, some articles with some links, and I'm going to make this presentation available to all of you, where there is now a phenomenon where you have... Um, European and American people who uh, are using melanin injections uh, to, in, uh, to turn their skin uh, darker. Um, there is also a booming melanin market with projections in 2029 
on the various products that um, Europeans can take to increase their melanin content and make their skin black. And what I'm suggesting here is that we will not be able to go on skin color alone due to these kind of technological and medical trends. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, uh, uh, Google um, natural melanin current trends, and you will see the amount of money that's being invested, even by entities such as NASA, to develop um, these things. So it's something we need to take into consideration when we are discussing the definition of the diaspora. Now, the African Union definition has attracted some criticism. Though it was adopted by consensus, two delegations at the meeting felt strongly on the need for a two-part definition, one of which would capture the academic or intellectual aspects, and the other that would be related to the political needs of the Union. We need to ask the question, what are these political needs of the Union that are going to inform the definition of the diaspora? Another delegation insisted on the need to add permanently to the phrase living outside the continent. Thereafter, others have argued that the phrase willingness to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union should be left out, claiming that nothing should be demanded or expected from the diaspora. They should simply be recognized ipso facto, as is the case with the Jewish and Israeli diaspora. The criticisms are useful, but they do not sufficiently address the complexity of the subject. The definition was arrived at after serious and deep reflection. The experts agreed that any working definition must combine the following key characteristics as necessary and sufficient conditions. A, bloodline and or heritage. The diaspora should consist of people living outside the continent whose ancestral roots or heritage are in Africa. B, migration. The diaspora should be composed of people of African heritage who migrated from or are living outside the continent. In this context, three trends of migration were identified, pre-slave trade, slave trade, and post-slave trade or modern migration. C, the principle of inclusiveness. The definition must embrace both ancient and modern diaspora, and D, the commitment to the African cause. The diaspora should be people who are willing to be part of the continent or the African family. <clears throat> At the meeting of experts on the definition of the African diaspora, the director of the Bureau of the Chairperson of the AU Commission said, uh, 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 stated, urged the participants to review the content of the definition, which would facilitate the involvement of the African diaspora in the activities of the AU. So whatever this definition is, this is going to determine who and how we work with the Af African Union. Further, it was expressed that a definition on the diaspora should resolve the problem of how the diaspora could become the sixth region of the continent and their participation in the work of the organs of the union. At that time, I submitted the following recommendation for the definition of the diaspora. Quote, the African diaspora consists of people of African origin, descent, and heritage living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. Under this definition, the Swede and people like Rachel Dolezal would be excluded on grounds that he or she did not possess an African heritage. Now, uh, I'm about ready to wrap this up. The lineage restoration movement is using genetic testing to help solve this problem of the definition of the diaspora and is trying to incorporate it into an eight pack one, uh, the agenda item under the citizenship pathway four, which is DNA right to return. Citizenship granted to a specific country to African diasporans that have taken an African ancestry DNA test and have either a maternal or paternal African lineage. Let me say right here that this is just one of five pathways. So for people who are not comfortable with taking a DNA test or for whatever reason, 
take a different DNA test. This does not exclude them from getting citizenship. There are five pathways. This is just one among the five. Now, why the African ancestry and why even use DNA in the first place? How does this help inform a definition of the diaspora? Of the diaspora? Well, the African di under the definition that I have put forward, the African diaspora consists of people of African origin, descent, and heritage living outside the continent. Only non-recombinant DNA through your direct maternal and paternal ancestral lineage connects origin, descent, and heritage. If you are a male, it is this non-recombinant DNA that you share with your brother, your uncles, your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather. It is what is common in every generation in your direct paternal line. And if you are a female, it is what you share with your sister, your mother, your aunties, and your great grandmothers and great grandmothers. Only African ancestry identifies the non recombinant DNA, and no other test can determine both origin, descent, and heritage. So let me. I'm a visual learner, so let me explain this to you using the chart. Here you are. Let's, let's take the example of the Swedish person, a person that has a Swedish father and a Swedish mother. Now, having a Swedish father, the non-recombinant DNA identifies and proves that that Swedish father had a Swedish father. And that Swedish father had a Swedish father. This is what we call your root lineage, non-recombinant ancestral lineage. It does not change throughout the generations. That same Swede with a Swedish mother means that her mother is of Swedish descent and her mother is of Swedish descent. Now, we also have these other grandparents and great grandparents in our family trees. And there are tests that measure their contribution, which is recombinant. This is the DNA that uh, changes. For example, you may have the eyes and ears of uh, this ancestor, but your brother doesn't because that DNA was passed to you, but was not passed and expressed to your brother. So. These two people taking the same non-recombinant DNAs will have different results. And from that result, it may say, okay, you have 3%, say, Cameroonian lineage. Just because you have a recombinant DNA that says you are 3% Cameroonian, but in this example, you have a Swedish father and mother, you have a Swedish uh, ancestral lineage on both sides, that would not satisfy the definition being proposed as African origin, descent, and heritage. I hope everybody understands that, okay? So um, this is one way that DNA testing can help inform whatever definition we decide is the most appropriate. So now that we understand that and we understand that we might not be able to rely on skin color and that um, technology is going to, um, in the near future, provide for race morphing, is the technical term being used in the Afro future uh, uh, um, uh, groups that I'm involved with. They are talking about both gender morphing and race morphing. So this is something we also need to consider as we go about talking about the definition of the diaspora. So that's my presentation to set the foundation. Now you understand um, how this definition came about, the motivation behind who proposed it, the compromises that were made, some of the challenges, and some of the proposed solutions. If you want to get a full understanding, there are two articles that I suggest that everybody read. They're lengthy. It was my job to sort of exhaustively document all of this. Now, having made my pre presentation, I am now very honored, and it's a great privilege for me, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Horn. Dr. David Horn is a longtime Pan-African elder who actually attended the 6th Pan-African Congress in 
um, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And when I had returned from the African Union in 2003 and began the African Union Sixth Region Education Campaign, it was Dr. David Horn who was the first to really understand the information and the, the opportunity of that moment um, and take responsibility to inform all segments of our community about what was going on, right? Uh, and how we were to organize the AU sixth region. Um, and from working with him, I have found Dr. Horn to be a straight shooter. He gets to the point, he's very fair and very diplomatic. And he has the experience, the wisdom, the understanding. In my opinion, he has been anointed for this work. Um, so with that introduction, uh, first, I would like to introduce our keynote presenter, Dr. David Horn. David, if you will unmute your microphone and also okay. turn on your video. Okay. Uh, is my video on? Yes, sir. Please proceed. You have the floor. Hola, everybody. Hello. Uh, Jumbo, et cetera. I would have to disagree slightly with um, my esteemed host, Brother Asifaway. I have not been anointed anything. Um, <laughs> I'm just an African brother trying to get work done. Also, given the depth of the presentation that he just made, I don't think I need to go through another lecture on, um, on the definition of a diaspora. We need to absorb a lot of the information that he has presented to us. And I would ask that uh, Brother Sifferway put in the chat the um, sources that he recommended that we look at. It's important. I'll, I'll get right to the point. The In July of 2003, in the protocols to the African Constitutive Act, the, an agreement was formed that the diaspora, otherwise recognized as resident and non-resident Africans, those who are living on the continent and those not living on the continent. The process would be getting the African diaspora to accept the definition and then to operate um, that way. The definition that Brother Sipaway just gave you is uh, is the one that we are talking about to make sure that we are dealing with the same thing. The African Union defined the African diaspora consisting of people of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. Now, for those who have been working with me for a long time, including Dr. Beryl Beekman, um, Brother Cliff, et cetera, we have been trying to get that definition heightened since 2003. Let me tell you the big obvious problem. There are other problems with the definition as Brother Sifway just gave you. But the big obvious problem is that the definition basically says the diaspora only identifies, only recognizes Africans not living on the continent. In Ghana, there are at least 4,500 members of the diaspora living all over, all over the country. At least 200, 200 of them have been made citizens, joint citizens or, or um, uh, citizens 
who will maintain their passports from their the country that they are recently from, and they'll get an African passport. But there are about 3,000 to 4,000 diasporans living in Ghana. There are at least 4,000 living in Nigeria. There are at least 2,000, including the, the Rastas, who are still living in Ethiopia. There are at least 5,000 living in South Africa. There are at least 3,500 living in Kenya. So what we have is this problem of if you were born in, say, New York, and you left New York, moved to Ghana, you wanted to return to, to Africa. Once you start living in Ghana, you've been there and said that you're not coming back to New York. You're no longer a part of the diaspora because the definition says the diaspora of those who don't live, who do live, uh, don't live on the continent. So again, if you were born in New York and you moved to Ghana, you are no longer part of the diaspora according to the definition that is already out there. That is an obvious problem. You have all of these folk who have moved to the continent who have intended to change their residency and they are not allowed to be called diaspora anymore and yet they don't really have the rights of citizens in the African area to which they have moved. So when we have this meeting in Zimbabwe to address one of the major issues of the diaspora, hopefully we can come up with something that incorporates that. That needs to be changed in the definition that the African Union is using and it needs to be changed immediately. Because again, mm -hmm. it, it simply, it, it simply ignores or wipes out at least 25 to 20 to, to 30,000 members of the diaspora who are now living on the continent or who intend to live on the continent. Now, every two or three months, whatever country you are in, you have to leave. You have to go and get your paperwork resubmitted. They give you generally 60 days or 90 days, and then you have to leave and go through the paperwork and come back again. Again, it is an obvious problem that needs to be addressed. And without going into a more detailed presentation, since Brother Sifferway has already done that, I'll rest my case. Dr. Horn, um, um, I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, I have seen in preparatory documents for the Sixth Pan-African con uh, Congress that one of the expected and intended outcomes that they were hoping for was this issue of dual citizenship for which you are speaking to. Um, since you were present, um, did that actually come up at the Sixth PAC? What do you remember about that issue? Because um, the fifth pack didn't deal with that because we didn't have independent states. It was really the sixth pack that kind of started on this question. Here we are now, uh, however, 20, 30 years later, you know, 74 till now, 50 years later. Um, just do you recall how it was raised at the sixth pack? It was simply raised in a committee meeting. It was never fully addressed. That was not something that the African constituents were interested in dealing with. It was mainly an issue that those of us who came from outside of Africa at the time, those of us who came from the Caribbean or from New York or from California, et cetera, we were interested in being welcomed back we wanted to find a way of being accepted back into the fold. The other members of the uh, committees that we were part of were not interested in, in that conversation. So it didn't go much. It didn't, we tried to raise it and they would kill it every time we raised the issue. 
And based on your working in this field, would you agree that the definition is largely informed by the original idea that they wanted to um, uh, attract the expatriate uh, continental right. Africans and reverse the brain drain with what they called brain gain, that, they, that that is intimately linked to the definition. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I do. They, uh, Salim Salim, the uh, former uh, executive director of the Organization of African Unity, was the um, the last diplomat to actually make the motion that got passed. I got a chance to question him when he made a visit to California uh, back in 2009, 2010. Because the conversation in this country, in the United States, and the, and the conversation in the Caribbean and in other parts of um, the world had had gotten had deteriorated to the point of a number of those who were what we call contemporary diasporans, those who had paid for their own passage, those who had recently gone to these other countries. And they were sending back money. They were sending back um, uh, residuals to their families what? still in Africa. They said they will be diaspora. And anybody right. else, anybody else, basically, you we are not considering you. To resolve that issue, Salim Salim had made the recommendation that that um, the diaspora be defined and be dealt with this way. I asked him point blank which part of the diaspora was he referring to when he made the motion. He was confused by the question. Of course. He said, of course, I mean those who were taken away from the continent. They didn't choose to leave. They were taken away. They were dragged away. They were captured. I was talking about the descendants of those folk. That was the diaspora I was talking about. I was satisfied, but unfortunately, the conversation continues and there is a continuing discussion and conflict in this region of the world I know. I can't speak about every, every place else, but there is a continuing conflict over the diaspora being those who have recently left and are continuing to send money back to Africa and those of us who were dragged away and our families. Again, part of what has to be resolved immediately is this whole issue of the diaspora simply being Africans who don't live on the, uh, on the continent because again, once you have moved back to the continent as we all have friends and acquaintances who have done that, once you have moved back to Ghana or to Kenya or to Ethiopia or et cetera, you see yourself as being still a member of the diaspora because that's what your paperwork says. That's what your passport says. You don't have an African citizenship. You have a French or a Mozambique or a Martinican or a United States passport. That issue needs to be resolved. You you don't simply stop being a diasporan by taking a flight to an African country. We have to have something a lot more definitive than that. And again, that's one of the reasons that I'm interested in the conference that we are talking about having in June. Okay, um, I would like to ask you one more final question before we move forward with the program, which is, um, I believe that we all agree that the kind of um, definition that we need, that we are going to hash out and figure out the best definition and propose it uh, uh, officially uh, in Harare, Zimbabwe at the 8th Pan-African Congress, um, whereby it would 
incorporate the traditional Pan-African values, you know, in, you know, uh, that is embodied in, in, in our music and our culture, you know, that, um, um, that we are all Africans, just some got dropped off in uh, Jamaica, some in Barbados, some in Trinidad, some in the United States, and then some came over on their own free will, but we are all Africans, we are kind of all in the same boat. Now, um, you and I know many of the people on this call are quite well aware of sort of the, the, the chaos and division that has been created by the Eidos movement. Um, and the 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 um uh the the other one i forget the acronym but what i'm saying is the what our work what we are doing the potential and it's, uh, it being adopted by the african union what do you think of the potential of um then sort of seizing the narrative to inform and heal that discussion uh um and the congress coming out of it as the 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 voice of wisdom in this whole debate. Do we have that kind of potential? <laughs> we have that potential, um, but um, <laughs> it'd be interesting if we can pull that off. That would be a brilliant, brilliant move if we could pull that off. Let me say this at the outset. Um, the eighth pack issue is one that you and I have already talked about. Uh, I've already uh, communicated with the other conveners of the conference that we're about to have. And it is to me now a trivial matter. So the advice that we've been given to try to move beyond trivialities and get to the heart of what is important, I'm going to try to adhere to. The main issue is citizenship. Everybody wants to feel that they belong someplace because one's travel, one's freedom, one's uh, ability to take care of business is all dependent on one's connection to a country or other. Again, one's passport and one's papers. It is crucial that non-resident Africans get something that can legally tie them to African countries so that they can make their contribution, so that they can help the African Union get to where it is trying to go without feeling that sense of being welcomed without feeling that sense of being legal, they're not going to do that. They'll come individually, then they'll leave, they'll, they will get this, they will get this hardened, they will get disgusted. They will come and they will go, they will come and they will go, but there will not be this body of diasporans who really can help Africa move forward. They won't come until they feel comfortable, until they feel protected. So I hope that the gathering that we are gonna have in Zimbabwe helps us get to that position. If we can come up with anything tangible that helps the African Union more permanently identify African diasporans and African citizens, African, those who belong in Africa and those who don't, then I think we would have done a great, a great uh, service to the whole African enterprise. All right, thank you, Dr. Horn. Um, yes, this, the definition of the diaspora is intimately linked with the citizenship uh, project. Um, and so, again, um, it's let great me, to have you. And yeah, go me, ahead. Let me add this one last thing. For most of the discussions, the serious discussions that have been going on, it's been dual citizenship that has been the driving force for a lot of the members of the uh, African diaspora, as we now define it. 
they want to be able to maintain whatever legalities and passports they have with the countries they are now living in, and they want to get an African passport. So they want to have both. They want to have access to both. If we can find a way of doing that, then we come to Zimbabwe. I think we would be recognized as being um, um, something significant, a historic gathering, um, something that may equal the importance of the Sixth Pan-African Congress, or the Fifth, for that matter. All right. <laughs> well, you, I have to respectfully disagree with my elder. You are just taking a pause because I know that when we get to the question and answer session, people are going to have questions directed specifically to you. So um, please stay with us. Uh, again, this um, question, uh, the African diaspora, definition of the African diaspora is intimately connected to working out um, citizenship. Um, I see that um, some people are starting to raise their hands. What we're going to do now is I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, and then immediately after that, we're going to go right in to the question and answer and comment period. Uh, but I want to keep this moving and sort of get the, the, the groundwork and the introduction. We get that established uh, and then we'll take input from everyone. Uh, we have 436 people on this uh, uh, Zoom already, which is fantastic. Now, um, our next speaker, once again, um, when uh, we first started doing this AU6 region work in 2003, Dr. Horn and I um, we're covering the Western Hemisphere, so on one side of the Atlantic. At the same time, it was Dr. Beryl Beekman who was doing that same work uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, primarily in the African diaspora in Europe. And together, Dr. David Horn and Dr. Beekman really carried for 20 years serious work on developing the AU Sixth Region. Dr. Beekman's work is so extensive. We had originally invited Dr. Beekman um, and her colleague, Tumenta Kennedy, to come on to um, uh, this meeting. But we realized that in order to do, uh, to do her justice, that she really needed a preparatory meeting um, uh, devoted specifically to the history of that work. Um, that she had been doing. So what we decided to do is we're going to schedule another preparatory meeting to give uh, Dr. Beryl Beekman uh, and Dr. Tumente Kennedy the space to discuss the work that they've been doing um, and their proposals on how to set up the AU 6th region. But right now, we're going to give Dr. Beekman five minutes to um, make her contribution specifically on the definition of the diaspora. And then when she finishes, immediately we're going to start getting your input. Uh, so with that, it is also my honor and my privilege to introduce uh, my friend, my colleague, my elder, um, the distinguished Dr. Beryl Beekman. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, King Brother uh, Sidney. Uh, let me first uh, greet uh, greetings Ubuntu Uburu Roots Energy family. Excellency Honorable uh, Ambassador Arikana, uh, the ADEDI uh, uh, team, management team, and the Vice President, uh, uh, Mr. Cook. And of course, uh, let me say my friend, <laughs> my King Brother Sipwe. And first of all, I would like to give thanks to the Almighty Go uh, Holy Spirit and honoring our ancestors who make happen that we are here today at this conversation. Honorable Ambassador um, uh, Arikana, this is personal for you. Thank you on behalf of our monitoring strategic and policy facilitators working group towards the implementation of the African Union, African Diaspora Six Region High Council. This is a structure towards a united and integrated Africa and its diaspora. I thank you for your personally calling me 
and for extending your invitation to be part of this uh, important conversation. Thank you for the energy that flows from your heart, your mind, and your spirit. Very passionate. I am here to listen in my capacity as the leading facilitator of the High Council Implementation Group. And of course, King Brothers Sibway is right. I start, you can say from 2001 in Durban with this, with the process, the process towards the integration of the African, uh, of the uh, Article 3Q of the Constitutive Act. Um, about the facilitators working group, uh, this is a, a, a facilitators group that exists of African diaspora with a long standing track record on the respective issues of Africa and African diaspora concerns and interests. Authorities who assist with the development of the High Council organization who contribute with the necessary passion towards the opera operationalization of the adopted leave no community behind model uh, on global, regional and national level. In, uh, in our understanding, we have been working tireless with our understanding of the diverse nature of the diaspora with a unique definition for the past 20 years in collaboration with the African Union towards the building of an integrated Africa and its diaspora. And for this, we shall be meeting in July this year to commemorate the Article 3Q of the Constitutive Act that was adopted and approved on July 11, 2003 in Maputo, Mozambique. The topic of today's conversation is of great importance that were also discussed during our Global Pan-African Root Synergy Roundtable in May from 23 to 27, 2022 in Addis on the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of the Global African Diaspora Summit. The importance of this May 22 uh, 22 roundtable must be value to the fact that many Africans in the African diaspora, including Pan-Africanists, other civil society activists, and those who passed away, had been working and waiting for decades for this uh, uh, pivotal uh, moment in 2012 for the adoption of the African diaspora region declaration after the integration of Article 3Q into the uh, African Union Constitution. That moment had preceded uh, by many sessions over a series of years and various levels of government uh, and community expertise. And the main objective of the Addis Root Synergy Roundtable Summit was to review the progress since the adoption of the African diaspora Region Declaration in 2012 on all the levels of cooperation as mentioned in the declaration, including the definition. The round table in Addis Ababa uh, oh, produced- yeah. Turn it into chocolate, send it back to Ghana, sell it back to them. And the round table in uh, Addis produced a declaration 10 years after and a resolution for the way forward. This includes the issue of the African Union six region definition. One of the agreements was the uh, concrete implementation of the leave no community behind that was adopted as a mod uh, model to organize the global diaspora and the re realization of the high council organization governance structure. And in our structure, we have committees. committees. And one of the committee that we established is the committee on the, on the definition, a committee uh, on the, the leadership of Dr. Horan. So uh, if you permit me, I uh, will go to uh, this, uh, this conversation 
uh, with regard to the definition. So this is what I'm to saying. Bring, uh, to, bring Dr. <laughs> to bring Dr. Kennedy. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yes, to bring Dr. Kennedy so that he can continue. He is one of the leading persons uh, of the High Council and uh, he is one of the leading persons of the definition. And it is, uh, and thank you that we will uh, receive uh, another time, a space to uh, to present our model. But now we will uh, do as uh, was uh, asked and agreed with, uh, with, the, with the ambassador. Thank you, Dr. Beekman, and welcome, Dr. Tumenta Kennedy. Um, please, uh, we are going to give you some space now to talk about your work on the definition. And again, um, we are going to create a special session for, for Dr. Beryl and yourself to have uh, an opportunity to present in full all that you have been doing. Uh, so now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Brother Supwe. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Ambassador, and it's a great pleasure for me to join this conversation on behalf of the many uh, Pan-Africanists that have worked tirelessly uh, in the High Council uh, facilitation with regard to the definition. As you can imagine, I take it from uh, Ambassador. Ambassador said at the beginning that we are fighting against each other. It's not only there. Uh, the African Union themselves, the head of states themselves, they are fighting for a specific issue which is about interest. And the whole definition put forward by Brother Sipwe and the explanation, you could understand that during the whole process, which I have, I was luckily to be there on behalf of the African Union, African Diaspora, European Six Region processes, we discovered that it was about interest. Today, as Amb uh, Ambassador, Rightly said, different types of diaspora understanding, and this definition itself explains it. One of it is the continental diaspora, and you can imagine, because of remittances and access to to uh, uh, resources, access uh, 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 redressing the brain drain issue, it was very easy for the continental uh, 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 states to attach themselves to the continental diaspora process. On the other hand, the historical diaspora themselves were also there looking for possibility to come in. But on that table in the Pan-African Parliament at the beginning, the whole issue about historical diaspora was not seen through the debate. But as time went on, they started seeing that if we're looking at interest, economic attachment, as people rightly said, then there is a problem. We need to bring people who have more than proportionate resources. That is why the historical diaspora themselves became an issue. But again, uh, Dr. Horan made it very clear, which we have seen in the last past years in the high capital process. We discovered that the African people themselves said, well, when it concerns historical diaspora, our first people to talk with are the states. That is why the CARICOM became their strategic partner to discuss. Little did they know that beyond the CARICOM, we have other diasporas that are not found within states, di uh, uh, diaspora and African origin control states. So the debate continues. On the other hand, we discovered that the second generation African diaspora, continental diaspora, meaning children of Nigerian or Zimbabwe that are currently uh, 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 the second generation uh, in, in, uh, in the US, United States, they don't feel, uh, uh, they feel they are diaspora, but they can't attach themselves to the continent because they were de delivered in the US, they grew up in the US, and they have no friends in Africa. So that is another problem that came in with the de definition. So imagine third generation, fourth generation, and now, as Ambassador rightly pointed out, we have a different type of fighting. First of all, the historical diasporas are saying they are the real diasporas. The continental diasporas are saying we are the real diasporas. The second generation diasporas will be saying, no, 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 we are the real diasporas because according to the definition of the African Union, we could identify the state of our ancestors, uh, the, the, the state of our ancestors back to the continent. So what does this mean for us? We have to drive a definition that is actionable. 
So for us at the High Council, we took the article, uh, we took the article 32 definition as a verb, meaning we have to act. And as people, as you rightly said it, they wanted something that could hurt them, interest driven. But does it mean interest and morality? So interest is bad? No. The whole issue is we are looking at this issue from a one angle. We are looking at the diaspora going back to the continent. So what about those in the diaspora? What about helping people in the diaspora to be developed? What about helping uh, 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 our diaspora countries like uh, Haiti, Suriname, and the rest to be developed? What about the hundreds of millions of people in Brazil, uh, uh, black in Brazil? So are we going to take them in the physical unification, take them off to the continent? That is why the High Council in the past 20 years, especially uh, our work across the different continents, we discovered that we need to figure out a more inclusive uh, uh, definition that does work, that helps us to help diaspora. So we, are, we want to combine two things, the spirit, a spiritual reunification and a physical reunification. Let a child in Haiti or in Suriname or in Barbados stand up and say, this is Africa, meaning that seeing this child, there is Africa, and from there, they can develop. Let all of us here do not only look forward in traveling to the continent, but moving around African communities, helping them so that the African spirit can develop. That's very important of this type of definition. Now, I, I took something from Ambassador Arikana again. She said, the way it works in Africa, uh, if you want to succeed, you have to work with the ruling party. We might agree or we might, dis or we, and we might disagree. But those who make decisions, those who help us, those who we have to convince to understand our pathway, we have to work with them. That is why our definition, which is an actionable verb, takes into consideration the historical diaspora, the 20th century diaspora or continental diaspora, and as well as the second generation diaspora. And that is where our understanding of the dual citizenship is a problem. Imagine this, Brother Sipwe. All of us, if we do our DNA and it says we come from Cameroon, so does it mean all of us who go to Cameroon? So what makes Cameroon Cameroon today? Three colonial, uh, 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 three colonial demarcations. So the dual citizenship issue, because the states we are seeing, most African states would set conditions because sometimes because of the political issues, because of antagonism to uh, uh, refuse the children of African continent. So what we have to do is to create a space which is beyond. And thank God, the African Union created a mechanism that we have never exploited. Under the chairmanship of the uh, uh, Rwanda ambassador, amb uh, Rwanda president, Paul Kagame, they came out with what is called the African passport. It was not a nation passport. It was a passport where we do not need a single citizenship to go to any country. Once we as a sixth region tie ourselves to a passport that permits us to go to any region, therefore we have an argument. If we cut treaties and say, oh, it's Tanzania, it's Botswana, um, uh, uh, it's Botswana, it's Tanzania, it's a problem. Let's say we have an Africa which is there for us. With this passport as a diaspora, we can enter any of these countries do businesses, let's set the modality and let's go in. So why you're right, our destination for the past year, they have accepted us. We have worked with the African Union, with Zimbabwe, with Tanzania, with South Africa. So what do we use? We discover that most of our people left the US, went back uh, to, uh, uh, went back to, 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 um, to the continent, and they were kept in Tanzania and do not have a, a space to live. Every month, as Dr. Horon said, they keep on doing work. They keep on uh, uh, renewing their, uh, every three months or six months. They have to go out or come in, renew their visa, get their passport. That is not work. That is a discriminative policy. So our definition says the African diaspora, that's what we have been using. And we have, within the high council process, we have seen many diaspora getting into the continent. And that is why we should, what we shall be doing in Zimbabwe 
as well as in Mozambique. We want us to go in with our competency, with our resources, and help these countries to develop uh, 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 innovative product, projects as well as ideas that could unite us. So the African diaspora for us consists of people of African origin now living outside the continent or returning without permanent residence and citizenship in an African country, irrespective of their current of their citizenship and nationality. We are willing to contribute to, de to the development of the continent and building of a united Africa and its diaspora. Here we saw two fundamental debates. One is that when you are in the continent and you do not have a permanent, uh, 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 permanent resident, you are still permanent resident or a nationality, you are still considered a diaspora. And the second issue is the debate of what about the structure of an African Union? Because our federal movement questions the whole idea of the current African Union. So we said a united and, and, uh, and integrated Africa and its diaspora. So uh, what, uh, I, I know my brother, Chipwe, you said you are going to give us an opportunity to exchange on this. But for us, it doesn't matter. So how could we, within a specific platform, where third interests of our organizations are not the key, but where Mbutu and solidarity help us to bring our competencies to help Africans uh, 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 in, uh, in, in, within different communities. That is why we call lead no communities, because we are organized in different forms and communities. So how do we help our independent organization, individual organizations, help our uh, individuals in terms of projects, in terms of dialogue, in terms of policy recommendations so that the continent itself could be integrated physically and spiritually so that we can contribute to the development of an integrated uh, uh, Africa and its diaspora. So, Thank you, I Doctor. Just... Yeah, that the answer to that question you just posed, we are going to address when we have sufficient time because as you well know uh, is a complex question that is going to require a lot of diverse input uh and differing opinions uh and we want to again to give doc, you uh yourself and dr beekman the the opportunity to go into that leave no communities behind model um uh, and all of the complexities that you're speaking of. We definitely appreciate the analysis that you gave uh, about the definition of the diaspora, because again, all of the citizenship issues are tied to who is determined to be part of the African diaspora. Uh, and so we have found it useful for the Congress for the eighth uh, Pan-African Congress part one, we have found it useful for the for the actual Congress as well as for these prep preparatory meetings to somewhat separate the issues of citizenship, which we did in our first prep meeting with this definition of the diaspora. Um, so um, what I'd like to do now at this time, um, I'd like to give her ambassador, um, Her Excellency, uh, Erica Nachihomboriqua, I'd like to give yeah. her an opportunity to um, say a few words. Uh, Her Excellency, uh, Erica Nachihomboriqua. I'm hearing some feedback. Um, just to give the ambassador a chance to say a few words as we uh, lead into this, this discussion. I have made a list of um, the people with their hands up in the order that they appear on my screen, which will be Brother uh, uh, Jami Luquan, Carol Walker, Roby Johnson, um, uh, um, His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Francis, Phyllis Powers, Yao, Chris, Alex, and Darnell. And again, uh, anyone who wants to, um, anyone who wants to, somebody's uh, causing a little bit of problem for me. Can I kindly ask each and every one of you, out of respect for our present presenters, to please mute your microphone. If you are moving, please just double check that your microphone is muted once you've relocated. Thank you. Is there anybody who can just explain how to do that for some? 
Okay, do I have the floor? Yes, you do. Thank you, Your, Your Excellency, okay. please. I was gonna take two minutes, but I noticed Dr. Tumenda did not do the final sentence. So I'll mm -hmm. use one minute of my two minutes to Dr. Tumenda to do the final sentence and close your comment. But the only other thing I wanted to just uh, suggest to um, Dr. Horn is to say, could we consider be thinking about a language that would say something to the fact that those diaspora who have repatriated, so then we are African diaspora versus repatriated African diaspora. So once an African diaspora, always an African diaspora. So you are either unrepatriated or repatriated. <laughs> I think it's a fascinating uh, discussion that we had. And as you were speaking, Dr. Horn, I know exactly what you mean, because I have lots of friends who are now repatriated, but then do they cease to become diaspora? So I think if we can have repatriated and non-repatriated, and then maybe we got legal people like, uh, Brother Sipiwe that can give us a better definition. But, uh, but you, you really hit the nail in the head because I know many in that position uh, as well. I will yield my, my one minute to Dr. Tumenta to do his final comment because I felt like you were still talking and you didn't finish your, your final comment. With your permission, uh, Brother Sipiwe, could I please. yield my one minute to Dr. Tumenta, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Dr. Tumenta, Tumenta, you have a minute to seal it up for us. Thank you very much, Ambassador, as usual, a mother that gives space for all the children to express themselves. Once more, thank you. And I think this is the pathway that we need to take. Ambassador, or what I want to say is the working definition that the High Council actually put together that will help us work, current, currently work with what is existing with the, with the different structures of the African continent is that the African diaspora consists of people outside the continent. Now, Ambassador, and now we come with the second part, which is all returnees who are uh, returnees without permanent residence and, 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 and without permanent residence or citizenship in an African continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and building of a united Africa and its diaspora. The whole issue here, Ambassador, is that we have to permit that those who have the rich need, uh, we are looking for a full integration of people of African origin. But, once we permit them to come back in order not to create a segregated class and issue, the African continent is willing and the African states are willing to integrate and we have to force them that they should not canalize and push all historic and diaspora to African diaspora to actually be tied to a country, but through a Pan-African passport that permits the diaspora to come in and go out, which could be worked out. And I hope that, Ambassador, with this definition, uh, uh, we will continuously get on the table, discuss in the Pan-African Parliament and different organs, as you have proposed, with the different uh, 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 committees uh, of the Pan-African structures, and we figure out how we could gradually integrate at different levels people on competent level. And I think that one spiritual diaspora spiritual and physical unification are brought together, we can go ahead. And the whole issue, Your Excellency, ending here, is that we want children in Suriname, children deliver in the, uh, in the United States, just like the Jews, they do. We want to build a, a relationship, go back to this community and empower. And that is what the African Diaspora uh, uh, six, uh, uh, six Region High Council should be doing. It is there. To support, and I hope that we will be able to have the opportunity uh, during the next meeting to discuss on an inclusive structure that takes into consideration all the different existing organiz organizations in a uh, action oriented structure that will permit us to meet our goals. Thank you very much, Chipwe and Ambassador. I thank you for giving me your minute. Thank you. May, if I may make one comment on the African passport. 
um, the African passport was approved. And currently where things are, and this is where again, we run into problems. You have to be a citizen of an African country. And now they have decentralized the issuance of that passport. So you have to go back to your country to apply for, a, for an African passport. Wherein lies the problem again. So those born outside the continent, they will not have access to the African passport under these conditions. So that's why it is pivotal that the descendants of the formerly enslaved must also have a pathway to citizenship. If we accomplish one thing in everything that we are doing, it is the passport, the dual citizenship for descendants of the formerly enslaved. The first generation children of continental Africans, they can get a passport from either their mother's side, a mother's country or their father's country. So they are covered. It is the descendant of the formerly enslaved that find themselves between a rock and a hard place. They simply cannot access the African passport the way the African passport is approved today. Now, for us to try and say, we're going to go in and ask for a special dispensation only for the descendants of the formerly enslaved to have a, an African passport, that's an uphill battle. Well, let's take small bites that we can chew. I really believe from the discussions I've had with some of the African heads of states, if we table a good agenda, we can get the dual citizenship. I am very confident of that. What is demanded is just our unity. So please, 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 let's stick together like super glue and push this issue. Because once that issue, we cross that bridge, everything else is gonna follow. Because then we are included. It becomes easy, even establishment of our physical sixth region, it becomes easy and moves a lot faster. So let's commit, let's stick like super glued, no matter how much disagreements or um, misunderstandings that we might have, let's put those aside. Let's singularly push that one because it is pivotal to everything that we do. Thank you, Brother Sipiwe. Thank you, Dr. Timenda. Thank you, um, Dr. Bickman and Dr. Horn. Uh, this has been, been really a fascinating uh, educational uh, session. I feel like I've been to school and back. Uh, we appreciate you also very much. I yield back to you, Brother Sipiwe.